Radio Panoa, Radio Nou. Would be a, a mass 
in the universe that sits between you and something behind it, and the light from behind it got lensed, what makes one lens better than another? Okay, so... Oh, I'm old enough to remember the very first lens discovered. That's how old I am. Wow. Yeah, we, all, we, were, we were losing our... Yeah. You're right. <laughs> oh, sorry. This is she's an eight-year-old child. Eight -year -old kid. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's a grown-up show. All right. Oh. I, yeah. So we think of we, we think of the universe as you know, the light comes to us, it follows straight lines, and wherever you see a star or a galaxy or whatever, but that's, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. Okay. The the universe is wibbly wobbly. So there's gravity everywhere that that that, that makes this space like this stretchy fabric, and so light travels by these. You know, slightly wiggly paths, but sometimes if there's a, a big mass of a galaxy lined up, then the, the light can travel multiple paths from some distant object, like the triangle across to us, and so instead of seeing one, we can see many four many images of that many one object. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So why why do you have a favorite one? But they all, they all sound like they look the same after a while. There are some that are just so oh, because just everything is lined up, they, they are all photogenic. Everything's lined up so perfectly that we just see amazing stuff. Like we, we you know, there's this the, the one of the very was it the first one, the Einstein cross. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. early. That was early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that one's really cool because the lens is really close to us, and so everything that's happening happens much more quickly. So we see the quasar flickering. Really quickly as the stars in that lens move around, and wow. just, uh, we can we can do really cool stuff. We can we can essentially map that distant black hole by looking at how the thing flickers. And, you, you know how we first discovered that it was an actual. So a lens, we have two images of right. a quasar. Okay. Initially, there's just two different quasars. Right. Until someone discovered that a variation in one quasar was the was, same. Re was repeated exactly. in the yep. in the other quasar, but with a time delay. Oh, uh, look at that. Okay, so it meant the two path lengths were different. And it was like, whoa. Oh, that's and a, everything changed matched. That's really cool. One, yeah, so it was the same object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we, we freaked out. Yeah, in, yeah. In a, in a joyous way. Yeah. That's how old I am. <laughs> Back in my day, we, we lived the first... <laughs> We discovered Earth in the first planet. First, we thought it was a copycat quasar. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Playing Simon Says. And we did. We thought these could be like binary quasar. What is this? What is this? That's my leg. That's no, my this leg. is. That's not your leg. That's nothing. What are you doing? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? You're ruining, whoa, whoa, hey, watch it, that's my leg. You're ruining these jeans. These jeans are expensive jeans. Do you know how much I pay for these? What is that? I don't know what you're talking about. This okay. right here on your leg? It's nothing. Okay. It's none of your business. Hey, you I got, have a problem. Like, can you even be searching me? Right I've got now? a knife on you right now. Oh Hang my on. gosh, please be careful. What? Okay on the dash cam. All good. Ridiculous. You're not 
table of elements is that from element to element the properties can be so different that it is not completely crazy that you just have an element that has all the properties of vibranium you know you can take a cubic inch of gold okay and hammer it so thin that you could like gild an entire football field with it so gold is the most malleable element 
Right. And that's why you gild things with gold. I mean, you can make it so thin that you can actually brush it onto surfaces and gold leafing. Here we have sodium, which is a metal soft enough that you can cut with a knife and it's poisonous and it'll explode if you put it in contact with water. Add chlorine to it, a deadly gas, and it's awesome. <laughs> okay? I have oxygen that that. promotes combustion, then I have hydrogen, an explosive gas, put them together, you make water that puts out fire. Right. This diversity of properties to tell you that vibranium is one of the most inventive, realistic things you can think of on there. It's got all these properties that no, nothing else has. What would happen to the ecosystem if half of all life would suddenly disappear? Because the bad guy on the Avengers Endgame snaps his fingers and half of all life goes away. He is trying to help the other half survive so that there's sufficient resources for them. So it's actually a, um, you know, a phenomenon that might be potentially very helpful to the planet. That's, planet what, that's, that's what he said. Like what would happen is that everything would be cut in half, so we'd see a tremendous loss. You know, people would be traumatized. There would be a lot of other kind of large brain animals that would be traumatized, right? Like the whales and the elephants and the gorillas that we've noticed can exhibit emotions similar to people. What's going to happen is a whole lot of reproduction, and especially with extra space, which means less competition for resources, we might actually see a spike in some populations of animal species. If you have a small population of deer or some kind of herbivore and a huge meadow full of plant foods for them to graze in, they're going to get bigger and fatter and in the ecological world that means more to fit. So we'll see a huge spike in population, maybe even beyond what ecologists call a carrying capacity. Maximum number of people. Or the availability of reserves is the maximum number to stay in that equilibrium. So what often happens is we'll see a population actually spike and overshoot carrying capacity, and then we'll see another kind of mass death event, and it'll get back into equilibrium. So it would actually be kind of an ecologist's dream to see this happen, especially in theory, because we'd be able to test out a lot of our theories. So it would overshoot? It would overshoot, yeah. A deer population herbivores would probably get there quicker than like whales or elephants or and if rabbits would get there first. <laughs> Why do I need any other Avenger other than Captain Marvel? You don't need anything. Now here, I have issues. That's her because, personality, by the way. So now, if you want her to move through space, you can imagine that she quantum teleports. If you put water in a glass, it can't get out because the glass has walls. Right. So the walls are boundaries between the location of the water and the table. Does it make sense that if the walls were not there, the water would then settle down and spill all over the table? Well, so what that means is the water has a lower energy state it could occupy, but the walls are preventing it. Quantum mechanically, you can trap a particle with the walls of a glass. It's an energy well. Okay. Okay? A marble stuck in a little skateboard park. And the marble can roll up and right. down. Back okay? and forth. Back, Back and forth. There it is. Right. It's not leaving. Okay? If you want it to leave, push it with fast enough energy so it goes over the top and then it goes down to ground level. But you have to give it energy to get over that barrier because particles can also be waves. The particle that's trapped in the well is also a wave that exists not only everywhere in the well, parts of that wave exist outside the well. So the particle has a chance, a small chance of existing outside of the well, a very high chance of existing in the well. So if she has control over the quantum continuum, she can then base, it's called tunneling. She can tunnel through any space barrier and be wherever she wants in the universe instantaneously. So she would be, in effect, entangled with the entire hey, universe. That's very clever. Yes. That would be a way to have her move through space in the way that she does. Wow. Quantum entangled with every with location, location in the universe. Right. So that she could then materialize herself wherever she needs to be. But she still can't move a glove <laughs> into a minivan. <laughs> Remember Tony, he figures out the quantum key to time travel by asking Jarvis for a Mobius strip. Yeah. I don't know if there was any real science okay. in after that. So it's called gobbledygook. <laughs> a special kind of movie science. Right. So there is such a thing as a Mobius strip. Okay. And a Mobius strip is a fascinating thing. If you want to make one, cut a ribbon of any length. It doesn't matter. You could tape the ends together to make a loop. All right. Okay. Give one of those edges a turn. Okay. okay, 180, 180 degree twist. twist. Then tape them together. So now what you have is kind of an S-shaped, like almost like figure eight that turns in and out on itself. That thing has only one side. You could draw a line along the length of it as you pull the ribbon through. And without ever lifting your pencil off the page, you will land back where you started and you would have put a line on all surfaces of it. It is, it is a ribbon that has only one side. If you cut it in half along the line you just drew, you make a single loop twice as big. Wait a minute, I see that. So feel it this, maybe you feel pretty visual, visual to know. Because what's happening is the twist now, as you cut, as it opens up, it just becomes a circle. A bigger circle. Okay, that's right. Is it 
rotating all of that work. They didn't give any thought to that. How is it that the Cap, as a Captain America, can throw his shield and it comes back to him like a boomerang? Because it is a frisbee. <laughs> Let's be honest. It doesn't just come back like it's on a yo-yo. Otherwise, you'd have to run after it every time he threw it. If there's a thing facing you, right. there will always be an angle with which you can throw something where it bounces straight back to you. So he's just good at pool. He's good at pool. Tony Stark says something like the Planck scale messes with the Deutsch proposition and creates the EPR paradox. So what the okay, what is I, he talking for, about? Forgive me, I don't know what the Deutsch proposition is, but he did mention the EPR paradox, which is the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. That's a real thing. What does it mean to not be able to fully know the reality of an object, of a particle? Heisenberg noted you can't simultaneously know the momentum of a particle or its position precisely at the same time. So Einstein's uncertainty principle means you can't know with accuracy the position of a particle and its momentum, mm -hmm. which means its velocity and which direction. speed and direction is going. Okay. The more you know of one, the less you know of the other. Ah. So if you know the velocity of something, you, can, you don't know where it is. Right. If you know where it is, then you know exactly how fast it's going. Okay. Even though you don't know where it is. Right. <laughs> Chuck, next time you stop for a speeding ticket, right? And the cop says, do you realize you've been going 65 miles an hour? Yeah, but I don't know where I am. <laughs> The cop is quantum physics literate. I bet they let you go. Yeah, that's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> so at least they made an attempt. They made an attempt. Real science. Yeah, it was an attempt. It was an attempt. Okay, Neil, I am Groot. <laughs> that's the question. Huh? That's a question. That's the question. Okay, so I think most people in life never really know who they are. So that really, at the end of the day, we should be deeply respectful of Groot, who does. Right, because he knows I am Groot. that there's another brood, 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 series a brood of cicadas that are coming. Not just that, there's two coming out simultaneously Ooh. this year. Is this correct? There's multiple broods coming out. These are two cycles that happen to match up. Mm -hmm. So are they two different species so, or subspecies of cicada? They're, they're, two, they're two different broods. So each brood sometimes can have multiple species, part of it, or subspecies or some taxonomy that people are still working out. Uh, but every couple of hundred years, you end up having these kind of multiple broods syncing up together. So, so it's just simple phasing. So if you, if you come out every five years, someone else comes out every seven years, in 35 years, seven oh, times five is 35, you've got a meat, you've got a double boom. Okay. And what that means is like huge numbers. So if we expect a regular brood, uh, like a, a medium or large size brood, uh, to have maybe a few million, if not a few billion uh, individuals, and then you have another brood that's also coming at the same time, put those numbers together, right? This is gonna be a loud, wild spring. As people will hear from all this, the sounds when the cicadas come out, it's a lot of individuals. So there's just so many of you that come out at once. Hopefully your brothers and sisters get eaten and you, right, don't. you don't. So the, the whole wait, 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 what, what did you just say? Yeah. yeah, so the idea, right, we think, it, what has driven this in evolution is that there's so many individuals in our marriage, you're protected, right? You kind of have the protection that you have so many brothers and sisters that also came out. Numbers, right? Yeah, you strengthen numbers. So you're more likely that others will get picked off by a bird, a lizard, cicadas as adults are really important because they're like a huge food source. So when they emerge, oh. they emerge in like the millions if not billions, right? And that's really important food. That's nutrients that go into the community. The mammals eat them, birds eat them, reptiles eat them. So as the adult, they're like a really important food source. And then as a juvenile stage, they're drinking and then pooping and they're putting, that actually is like part of the nutrient cycle in the soil. How important can it be if you're a food source? Should come 
not in this area, right? But we always aren't certain until they start coming up. How many? The, the concrete cement and the tree that was cut down, they died because they didn't have any sap. That can happen. So habitat loss is like a really serious concern for cicadas. So for periodical cicadas, uh, what we hope every year is that we get a big emergence in an area. But there have been parts of their range that have gone extinct, like locally extinct. Almost we used to have a lot more in the five boroughs, for example. Oh, New York we, City. Yeah, for the broods that come out, they're supposed to come out around here, and we haven't seen them recently, other than a little bit on Long Island. And coming up in Fifth Avenue. Wait, so where in the United States is most susceptible, if not Times Square, New York? I was susceptible, most lucky to receive this, this yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who among other humans will be graced with the presence of billions of cicadas? <laughs> uh, so we're going to be expecting this in kind of the Midwest. So if you're in Illinois, you probably will expect to experience this. Parts of Indiana, you'll expect to experience this. But Chicago is in Illinois, so not in Chicago. How about Lakeshore, where you have some vegetation? Well, really, it has to do with past land use changes, remember? Because so if there were forests that were cut down, we tend to see that the fruits don't necessarily still exist in those ranges. Uh, so we aren't going to be expected to see any in our area, but next year, next year, uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, we can all go out and see. I think it's more two that emerges this year. What you'll first see, maybe, are these things that are called cicada chimneys. It looks like little kind of bits of dirt that are sticking up the ground. Then you'll start I've seeing holes. I've seen those. They're called chimneys, and that's when they're really close to the to the surface, and they're kind of little breathing tubes. Then you'll start seeing holes, and this is where the, the nymphs have emerged. Um, and it looks just like someone has, like, like put a cane or like a stick and made little holes all through the, maybe you'll see it in your backyard or maybe you'll see it in the park so near you. they're arming themselves. They're, they're kind of crawling out. The juveniles look totally different from the adults and they find vegetation. Sometimes it's bark, sometimes it's like twigs or, or branches and they start climbing up. They have an impulse to, to climb vertically upwards. Whatever it is. Okay. Right? And so what you might see if you go to a park or if, you, if you're near trees is you might see these things that look like brown, um, almost like humpbacked uh, creatures claws that are on the ends of their feet that are clinging to the bark or to the vegetation, that's the baby, right? That's a horror movie she saw last night. <laughs> <laughs> they have to attach to the tree pretty well because then what they use, they, they use their, their blood is called hemolymph, uh, so they kind of shunt their hemolymph and like push with pressure and the adult basically cracks up in the back, which sounds grosser than it is, it's beautiful to watch, and then the adult emerges, the adult has wings, and the adult, um, has, oh, usually they have, they, for periodical cicadas, have reddish colored eyes, um, and then it's still a little bit of time before they start singing, so there's going to be a period of time when you might see these adults, but you don't hear anything, right. and then boom, like once their skin is hard, um, their skin is called the cuticle, it needs to harden up. Males have a, an organ called the temple organ, which is basically like the skin of a drum, and it vibrates. It needs to be, the cuticle is very soft when it first comes out of the, the shell. Uh, the exuvia is what we call it. Uh, so it hardens up, so it's about a week where you're just seeing them, but you're not hearing them, and then all of a sudden you'll hear the males. <laughs> That's the drum. Yeah. 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 It is. So the sound is communication. So the males are communicating two things. One thing that they're communicating is that they can sing loud. And if you sing loud, it's a very energetically expensive to do that. Uh, it means you're probably a good mate. You probably have fitness. You'll probably be able to make sons that can sing loud. They will be chosen by females yeah, in the future. Yeah, genes tend to okay? right? But the other thing it's also telling is they tend to call in the hottest part of the day. And it's really hard to use it to burn that energy in the hottest part of the day. It does. So, right. so if you're able to call really loud and you're able to call in the hottest part of the day. I'm loud and I have stamina, baby. <laughs> um, right. And then females, females answer. But they don't move very far. I mean, to be, for all intents and purposes, we're talking about like a single field. They'll be calling and kind of interacting with each other. There's no cicada that's going to be smart enough to find the PA system. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of sit on 